Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator at McNally Robinson Booksellers. We're broadcasting live today from Treaty One territory, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We're here tonight with many thanks to the Prairie Garden Committee for putting together this evening for us to celebrate the launch of the 2021 Prairie Garden, flowering shrubs with a special feature on roses. Uh, I'll just give you an idea of what the evening will look like. We'll have a few presentations from uh, some of the contributors to the volume, including the guest editor, editor, and one of our contributors, at which point we'll open up the floor to questions. Over the course of the evening, as questions occur to you, please feel free to write them in the Q&A box. That's the box that's right at the bottom of your screen. Rest assured that as you're writing, you won't interrupt us at all, so you can put questions in there at any point. One thing that we're going to experiment a little bit with tonight, because we have such an incredible brain trust out there, is that if a question does come in and it's related to an area of gardening that may not be the specialty of one of the presenters, uh, we're going to throw it open to somebody who might be here. So if Linda uh, or whoever else is involved in the Q&A does mention your name and you're keen to join us, either appearing audibly or via video, then feel free to just press the button that raises your hand. If you don't raise your hand, we'll know that you'd prefer to just kind of sit back and watch the evening. So rest assured, we will not force you to answer the question. I'll go over this a uh, little bit more just when the Q&A actually gets started following the presentations. Now, we're having a slight technical difficulty this evening in that uh, Linda's web camera isn't working. So she will be introducing the evening, but you will see a still photo of her, but you will still hear her voice and see the beautiful images that she has as part of her presentation. Before her retirement in 2016, Linda Dietrich was a professor of German language and literature at the University of Winnipeg. She has also been an avid gardener for over 30 years. Her garden has been featured on a number of tours. As a certified master gardener, she enjoys volunteering in the gardening community, as well as speaking and writing about plants and garden design. Please join me in virtually welcoming Linda Dietrich. Well, thank you, John. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me OK. And I want to thank uh, McNally Robinson Booksellers and all of you for joining us today for, uh, to help us celebrate the launch of the 2021 Prairie Garden, our 82nd edition. I am really, really pleased to see that so many of you have joined us in, in our virtual audience tonight. And it's especially wonderful to see so many contributors and friends who have tuned in from far away. I'm just going to share my screen now. And share. Now, the Prairie Garden does go back a very long time and there you see our very first uh, cover and our 1957 cover. cover. Um, aside from the three years during World War II, uh, from three years during World War II, the Prairie Garden has been published every year since 1937. Originally, it was the annual report and yearbook of the Winnipeg Horticultural Society, and the title was, as you see, the Winnipeg Flower Garden. Then it became briefly the Flower Garden until finally in 1957, after its readership had expanded all across the whole Prairie region, it was renamed the Prairie Garden. And from the very beginning, the Prairie Garden has been edited, published, and sold by an entirely voluntary committee, volunteer committee on a nonprofit basis. Since 2000 or so, when the original sponsor, the Winnipeg Horticultural Society, was disbanded, uh, the Prairie Garden has been published independently by the Prairie Garden Committee. And here are the members who were responsible for producing this year's book. Um, I owe all of this team my most sincere thanks. Um, I also want to thank um, our absolutely excellent and creative graphic designer, Lisa Friesen of Ninth and May Design. Here are a few covers from our past. The fast, fact that our book continues to be successful after 82 years must surely have to do with the fact that unlike publications, say, from the US or from Eastern Canada, its information has always been specific to our region. And our writers have, inc have included a virtual who's who of prairie horticulturalists over the years. Frank Skinner, Henry Marshall, John Walker, Louis Lentz, and Lynn Collicutt. More recently, Wilbert Ronald, Sarah Williams, Kevin Toomey, 
and Colleen Zacharias, to name just a very few. This year, we're revisiting two of our most popular themes. The 2008 Roses edition, which is now out of print, uh, was probably the best short handbook you could buy on roses specifically for our region. Uh, you can fill, still find sample articles from this uh, issue on our website, theprairiegarden.com. Our 2009 issue, Deciduous Shrubs, was guest edited by a slightly younger version of this year's guest editor, Dr. Philip Ronald of Jeffrey's Nurseries, and it is still available. It's got lots of information that is not duplicated in this new shrubs edition. For example, um, how to grow azaleas on the prairies. If you don't have uh, the 2009 edition, you can purchase it at uh, McNally Robinson Booksellers and through our website. Here are some of our more recent editions, Herbs and Spices, Spices from 2017, edited by Dave Hansen of Sage Garden, uh, the beautiful 2018 Shade issue, edited by Lindsay Sable, uh, Growing Food from 2019, guest edited by Tiffany Grenko, and the very popular Inspired by Nature, guest edited by Maureen Krauss. All of these are available at McNally Robinson. You can also order these and many older issues going back to about 1996, directly from us uh, at, through uh, theprayergarden.com. So here is this edition's new editions table of contents. What you see here are 61 articles by 51 different writers. And I am delighted to say that many of these contributors are here with us tonight, which is what Zoom allows us to do. And I would like to recognize especially those who have joined us from far away. Um, as of noon today, um, contributors, far away contributors who are present include Cheryl Normando from Calgary. Todd Boland is here from Memorial University of Newfoundland. Hugh Skinner from Dropmore, Manitoba. Sarah Williams, good friend Bernadette Van Gool is here from Saskatoon. And Todd West from North Dakota State University in Fargo. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. Now, looking at the special section on roses specifically, and rec again, recognizing folks from far afield, I welcome Wendy McCoon's genius, along with her father and sister, here from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, to honor her late mother's uh, storytelling and teachings in the year the roses died. Um, also here is Rick Durand, um, a Manitoba boy, but uh, he now lives in Kelowna, British Columbia. And Alex Henderson is here uh, from uh, Royal Botanic Gar Botanical Gardens in Burlington, Ontario. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, in addition to Philip Ronald and Sandy Venton, whom I will introduce in a moment, I also want to welcome our other local contributors, Colleen Zacharias, Darlene Belton, uh, Jane Cahill, Bill Dowie, Dietmar Straub and Anna Tuermeyer, Liz Sellers, Brent Poole, Fran Wurschler, Rita Campbell, Colin Briggs, Ian Wise, Michelle Taylor, and photo contributors Richard Denishuk, Becky Slater, and Gordon Goldsborough. I do apologize if I've missed anybody. So I mentioned our website. Uh, there you can find something new this year, a comprehensive subject index to all articles going back to 1937. If you have been collecting prairie gardens over the years, you can use this index to find articles on a specific topic or by a specific author. Currently, you can consult the full archive of books at the Manitoba Legislative Library and everything up to 2014 at the University of Manitoba. However, this year we received a Manitoba Heritage Grant to digitize, that is make scans of all our old paper past editions. And I've been working on this project and very soon I hope we will be able to put up a digital collection from 1937 up to the 1990s uh, on the web so you can read it there. Um, before I turn the proceedings over to Philip and Sandy, I have two announcements. First, our theme for the 2022 edition will be gardening in small spaces. Very timely topic now, I think, when so many people have really gotten into smaller scale gardening in their yards, in containers, and indoors, whether with grow lights or without. Um, we know that there are many new and old gardeners out there who are looking for up-to-date information on this topic. So watch for our next edition. And second, I am extremely pleased to announce that my successor as editor of the Prairie Garden will be Dorothy Doby. As you can see, she has sterling qualifications to be our editor, our next editor. She will be taking over editorial duties in December. 
If you have any thoughts uh, on our next edition, you can contact her at editor at theprairiegarden.ca. Um, our uh, email addresses end with .ca. Our website ends with uh, .com. So editor at theprairiegarden.ca. Uh, the deadline for article submissions is going to be April 1st, but uh, please do get in touch with Dorothy before you submit anything. And you can find submission guidelines on our website. Now let me introduce Philip and Sandy. Uh, Dr. Philip Ronald, our wonderful guest editor, studied plant breeding and horticulture at the universities of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. He divides his time between teaching ornamental horticulture at the University of Manitoba, managing Riverbend Orchards, a 20 acre fruit farm, and supporting the research and marketing programs at Jeffrey's Nurseries in Portage La Prairie, Manitoba. Philip will speak for around 20 minutes on flowering shrubs. Now, Sandy Venton is also someone many of you know, I'm sure, a, a longtime member of the Prairie Garden Committee who contributes uh, every year to our book. She is a master gardener, the secretary of the Manitoba Regional Lily Society, a lily breeder and a judge, and a frequent speaker at gardening groups uh, on a wide range of topics. After Philip has finished uh, talking about flowering shrubs, Sandy will take over and speak about one of her passions, roses, with lots of luscious photographs. And then we'll conclude with the question and answer period. So thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Philip. There you go. Thank you, Linda. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's virtual book launch. Tonight we have the privilege and the opportunity to introduce the 2021 Prairie Garden book, Flowering Shrubs with a Special Feature on Roses. Don't wish to be redundant tonight, but I do want to mention that it was a privilege to work with Linda, as well as the Prairie Garden Committee in putting this wonderful book together. I would like to personally thank many friends and colleagues who took their valuable time to write articles that constitute uh, this edition. I'm going to share my screen here now because I have a, a PowerPoint that I want to share with you tonight. Uh, just looking at at some of these wonderful plants that we've had an opportunity to talk about in this book. This photograph, courtesy of Van Bell Nurseries in British Columbia, we chose as our cover because we thought it represented just a delightful combination of foliage, flowers, and even a visiting insect. This, is all, this, this plant is known as firefly bush honeysuckle. This was just some thoughts that came to me there kind of musings, I guess you could say, as you enter into a, a task like this and uh, allow me to read them to you tonight. Flowers are truly a lifeline to another world. Sepals, petals, stamens, and pistils combine in a dazzling mixture of color and fragrance that is unmatched anywhere else in nature. Whether cut in a vase or intact on the plant, we find solace and comfort in flowers. I had an opportunity to work on a few of the articles in this wonderful book. And I would just like to share with you some of the background of these articles. Um, and I'm hoping it will be an inspiration to gardeners, landscapers, and all who have joined us here tonight. The first article in the book that you'll find as you open the cover is called Never Ending Flowers. Shrub, shrubs that break the rules and how they do it. And I was educated uh, in, in woody plant materials, landscape plants under the instruction of Professor Louis Lenz. I was fortunate to be a student in his last class before he retired back in 1993. And one of the things Professor Lenz taught us is that flowers were ephemeral. They were very short lived. Beautiful eye candy, but they're just for a few days. That is generally true. But as we have witnessed in recent years with the development of so many new cultivars, there are exceptions to that rule. Two of them are actually pictured here in this background photograph, Potentilla in the foreground and Hydrangea in the background. Now, as most of you know, the the majority of the plants we grow in the landscape here in the prairie region produce spring flowers 
and those flowers come from wintered buds. We witness a beautiful explosion of flowers in the spring from these over, overwintered flower buds. But the duration of that flowering period is fairly limited. Depending on the weather, it can last anywhere from seven to 14 days. But we don't under, want to understate these plants. As you can see in the, the right hand side there, pearl bush, double flowering palm, forsythia, these are all examples of these wonderful plants that are harbingers of spring. They break through the monotony of winter with dazzling colors each and every year. But I, where I was going in this article was to dig out some of these unusual plants that produce never ending flowers. We have a group of plants that continually form flowers. They are generating flower buds constantly as new wood is produced. And what that means is we have flowers that are constantly popping open and a bloom time that believe it or not can last for up to four months through all of our summer and into fall. Two of the examples of, of shrubs that show this characteristic are of course the lowly potentilla and our summer blooming spireas. We also have a group of plants that have gained tremendous notoriety in, in the last 15 years and they're called hydrangeas. And what I wanna tell you about hydrangeas tonight is they have what I would like to put forward as indestructible flowers. We have two major species of hydrangea that we use in the prairie region. The first is arborescence, the smooth hydrangea, and also paniculata, the panicle hydrangea. What is remarkable about these plants is they produce flowers that have a duration of up to three months. Those same petals, those same flowers, they are unaffected by weather or natural senescence. And the secret to these indestructible flowers is that they don't have any petals. And you say, well, what are we looking at there then? Well, what you're looking at are what are called weather resistant sepals. And they are the secret to the indestructible flowers of hydrangea. They turn color, they start off as bright white and end the season in shades of pink and red. Because the bulk of these flower clusters consist of sterile florets, there's no fruit produced. So there's nothing to stop this wonderful floral display from continuing right up until that first killing frost. Just a little aside when it comes to hydrangeas, it's something that we wrote in the article and I'd like you to think about, and it is the value of pollen. We had some wonderful articles in this book about insects. You'll find them at the back of the book, caterpillars and native bees and very well done. And it is at the top of everyone's mind this day that is a gardener, how can we promote and sustain these insect populations that are so important to us? Well, one of the things with hydrangeas that we learn very quickly is although they have wonderful floral displays, those flowers are generally, or those panicles are generally composed of sterile florets. So they're very showy, but for an insect, it represents an empty buffet. Imagine going to your favorite buffet restaurant and finding the entire eating bar empty of food. You'd be disappointed. And so I think it is for these insects as they approach these wonderful looking plants and they land on these panicles and find that there is nothing to eat. Now that's not completely true because we do have a few cultivars that offer a mixture of sterile florets and pollen producing flowers. And you're looking at one in the bottom right there. These are the panicles of quick fire hydrangea, pinky winky, another one of the same species that shows that characteristic. And over on the arborescent side, we have a cultivar called Lime Ricky. So just something to think about in the back of your mind. Let's talk for a moment about inflorescences. We wrote a little article about these structures and I'm happy to hear that Todd is on the conference tonight because this is a plant that his name is attached to, Iceberg Alley Willow. Todd Bolin from Newfoundland. And what a wonderful picture. I mean, what we're witnessing here is a, an inflorescence, a catkin by name. And we have two catkins that have not completed anthesis. We've got one that's in full blown pollen shed, but just a wonderful blend of colors in it. It, it gets us excited about spring already. 
What is an inflorescence? Well, these are botanically recognizable structures. We could actually look at them. We can assign a name to them. And they contain anywhere from tens to hundreds of flowers in an individual structure. Most of these inflorescences are terminal. They're born at the end of branches. Some of them can be up to 30 centimeters across, as you can see in the photograph here of invincible spirit hydrangea. These inflorescences have a wow factor that stops us in our tracks as we're walking by. Just delightful eye candy, wonderful aesthetic value, and so much grander than some of the solitary flowers that get lost under foliage. So I'll take a moment. I don't want this to be a, a crash course in botany, but it, just to share with you some of the things that we talked about in this article. Um, this is the panicle. One of the most obvious inflorescences that you'll find in the plant world. Very easy to recognize because it's a distinctive cone shape. The blooms open from the bottom to the top. We find this in our panicle hydrangeas. We find it in red elders. We find it in lilacs of all species. And there would be other examples as well. The corum, interesting enough, is a rounded cluster of flowers. The way to recognize a corum is to look at the very center of the cluster. And if you find a flower there that has not yet opened, seems to be lagging behind, you're looking at a corum. The youngest flower in the center and the cluster blooming from the outside inwards. This is what we find in smooth hydrangea and common nine bark. What about the lowly syme or chyme as it's pronounced another rounded cluster? And the distinction here with the corum is these bloom from the inside out. So the oldest flower is found at the middle of the cluster. And this is characteristic of dogwoods and viburnums. Darlene Belton wrote a, an article for us in this edition on cranberries. And I have often marveled at the beauty of a cranberry inflorescence as you can see in the bottom right that mixture of fertile flowers and then ringed by that sterile uh, grouping of white flowers, just something from another world. What about racemes? These are unbranched inflorescences. If any of you have ever picked choke cherries in the wild, you know very well what a raceme is. The flowers are attached to the central axis, each one carried on a short stalk. Now we have a couple shrubs that show this type of inflorescence. One we're looking at here, the pearl bush. Another one, the native Saskatoon berry. Finally, on inflorescences, I want to introduce you to a very novel and unusual one called the head. And a head inflorescence is simply a dense, rounded group of flowers. Very common in herbaceous plants, but very rare in woody plants, particularly when we come up into zone three. We do have a plant though that is pushing its way into zone three called button brush. And this particular shrub offers us this fascinating flower cluster called a head. I wanna just take a minute as well to talk to you about an article that we wrote about trialing new shrubs. And I've had the opportunity over the last uh, I guess it's almost eight or nine years to be involved in a shrub cultivar trial. Choosing the plants, setting them up, making ratings on a biannual basis, and trying to gather information about all these different cultivars that are in the marketplace. Which are the ones that are best adapted for our harsh climate? This is a photograph of, of the shrub trial at Jeffrey's Nurseries, just south of Portage La Prairie. And you can see it's not a very protected site at all. Fairly harsh. If a plant comes through here with flying colors, it's a true graduate. It's destined for success, at least in the southern prairies. Some of the plants that we have noted in this trial, we consider them graduates. They have proven themselves. They have shone, among other plants, include a group of nine barks that we're going to call tiny nine barks. Now that particular combination of two words would have been considered a real oxymoron until recently, because most of our nine bark cultivars show tremendous growth rate. In fact, they will produce through bolting runners in a single year that can be six feet in length. What that means is annual pruning is required to try to retain that form. 
But what we've seen in the last number of years is the development of some small statured cultivars of nine bark, truly distinct and different. And you're looking at some of them here, including Festivus Gold, Tiny Wine, and of course, Royal Jubilee, the most recent introduction. What about lilacs? We have the same situation there, don't we? Where if we go back to the cultivars of 50 years ago, many of them will reach a height of eight to 10 feet, larger than what most landscapers and gardeners are looking for. And so the question arises, can we reduce plant stature while retaining these beautiful panicles, fragrant panicles of flowers for which these plants are recognized? And the answer is yes. Um, we are seeing small statured cultivars come to pass. Uh, Pinktini, which is in the Preston species. Little Lady, which is a fascinating hybrid between Miss Kim and Little Leaf Lilac. What about red elders? Now here's a plant that, you know, for a long time we, we knew it had some good properties, but not much was done with it. Red elder offers finely divided golden foliage. Beautiful characteristic to look at, to use as contrast in a landscape bed. It also shows amazing spring activation. And what I mean by that is when I walk through this trial at the end of May, so many of the plants look tired. They're licking their wounds from a harsh Manitoba winter. And you can spot these golden elders from, you know, 100 meters away because they're alive, they're healthy, they're happy, they're bursting into spring. For a long time, red elders were just considered, again, too large. Look at a cultivar like Sutherland. But again, we've seen two new small statured cultivars arise, Lemony Lace, which is pictured here, and Morden Golden Glow, one of the last releases from the Morden Research Station Ornamental Program. Here's a question for you tonight. Is there a hardy barberry out there? Is there a barberry that works in zone three? Well, we know this group, Japanese barberry, has wonderful foliage, both in the summer and in the fall. They have delightful forms. Many of them are perfect little balls without a lot of pruning. However, many of us have that have trialed these in our home landscapes, we've, in the spring, opened our eyes to a scene like what you see in the top right corner here with extensive winter damage, sometimes three quarters of the canopy erased. Well, what we found in a trial of about eight or nine different cultivars is there are some exceptions. There are some, some of these cultivars that are good enough and tough enough to last even in Manitoba winters. Emerald Carousel is one that has risen right to the top. You know, it's a medium statured cultivar. And then Concord, a dwarf purple leafed cultivar. Both of these are exceptional performers in our area. What about Wygela? Well, here again, we've, we, I think we've got 20 cultivars in the trial. So many of them, when you go out there in June, they are killed to the ground. Uh, just tufts of dead wood. But there was one that stood out as just completely different. Imagine a, a, a cultivar of this species with no winter dieback over six years. Yeah, it just has green leaves and it only has white flowers, but it's hardy. And this is April snow. It's uh, from the species Wygela praecox. It comes from the mountains of China. And in our testing, we actually believe this probably could go into zone two and still perform well. Here's a plant with a new color, purple leafed hazelnut. And this is a selection. It doesn't actually really even have a fancy name at this point. It comes from Bailey Nurseries. They weren't sure they were gonna be able to propagate it successfully. It seems like they figured that out now. And what we have here is a fresh foliage color, this delightful purple for a hardy native species. Wonderful plant to use in the background of a landscape bed. We'll close with this one. This is Lotus Moon Pearl Bush. Here's a plant that had been rated zone four. Everybody, if you read any catalog, you wouldn't have believed it would stand a chance in Manitoba. But we put some of these in on the outside of the trial, five plants. They have passed through six winters without a mark on them. It is a plant that in the spring is simply outstanding. You can see the round flower buds in the top left corner there of the flower box, and then opening up into these beautiful five-petaled flowers. 
I want to just remind you that there's a lot of fascinating articles. If, if we had the whole night, we could lead you through some of these, but I would just like to, again, thank every author who contributed articles on flowering shrubs. Many of these people I would esteem to be regional experts. They have worked in the trade for decades. They have tremendous knowledge and they have brought it to this book and we give them a real thank you for that. Now, Sandy's gonna to talk to you about roses and I don't wanna steal her thunder in any way, but I wanna show you one photograph when it comes to roses. They say a picture's worth a thousand words. And when I saw this photograph, and this was kindly sent to us um, by Doug and Carol Mitchell and Markham, this is Campfire Rose. This is a Morden introduction. This is one of the outstanding Canadian roses that we've seen released in the last 10 years. And you've got just some idea in a photograph here of just how successful roses could be. We've seen improvements in disease resistance. We've seen these wonderful floral colors emerge. And it's, it's, it's an exciting time to be a rose grower. So with that, I'm gonna pass things over to Sandy. I wanna just thank you all for listening tonight. And I hope that you really enjoy this book. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Roses are my passion. Lilies are my passion, roses are my passion. I have several passions. <clears throat> but what I really wanted to do tonight is read you a couple of excerpts from people who have written about roses. Fran Wurschler, she's a former editor of the Prairie Garden. She's a member of the Manitoba Regional Lily Society, the St. James Horticultural Society and the Master Gardener Association of Manitoba. And this is an excerpt from her article, High Points in the Prairie Garden, Tall Roses. She says, as you look at your flower beds, do you sometimes wonder if a little height here and there would make them more exciting? Some taller perennials or clematis on a pillar might achieve this, but a tall rose might create just the best focal point. The climbing roses grown in more temperate places are not realistic objectives in our zones two or three. But take heart, you can still get the look of a climber. There are a number of beautiful and cold hardy roses that will reach a meter and a half, which is five feet or more in height. Tall roses have certain requirements. They do not stand erect without something to lean on, and they have no tendrils to twine around supports. They have tall but thin canes that bend from their own weight, and without a support, these characteristics produce a very sprawling bush. Supports themselves can add interest and beauty to your garden, but really have to be in place before the rose is planted. I've seen friends uh, masquerade on a tutor, or obelisk, or whatever you want to call it, and it really is fabulous. So we can all do that. We just have to use the hardy roses. The other person who I'd like to quote is Rick Durand. Now, Rick Durant has evaluated thousands of rose seedlings from the research program of Agriculture Canada, Violent, and Violent Research and Innovation Centre and Amateurs. This is an excerpt from his article, The Passion of Amateur Prairie Rose Breeders. He says, people who love roses and cultivate them in the garden are called rosarians. Many amateur rose breeders start as rosarians, but become so passionate about roses that they want to develop their own. They spend long hours studying the parentage of roses and trialing roses in their backyard plots or acreages. In our region, amateur rose breeders are dedicated to an especially challenging goal, creating a truly prairie hardy rose. These individuals must have thick skins since they have to deal with bad weather, deer, and other pests, and poor germination. Rose breeding is time consuming, and developing the perfect rose can take decades, or with some luck, only a few years. For some breeders, the dream is to create a unique, hardy rose that will be brought to the marketplace but most simply enjoy the journey from pollen brush to the adrenaline rush of creating a rose of their own. And this article is about some of the current amateur rose prairie breeders. 
Rick says, when I contacted them, they told me their stories. And he writes about their stories, and they're really interesting. Now, I love roses, but I've never, ever tried to hybridize them. And I would also like to say that Bob Osborne owns Cornhill Nursery in New Brunswick. And he's written a book called Hardy Roses, The Essential Guide for High Latitudes and Altitudes. And this is an excerpt from his article, Canadian Heritage Roses for Cold Country Gardens. He says, although a few Canadian heritage roses, such as Teresa Bounier, are commonplace in the market, most of these roses, bred roughly between 1900 and 1970, never took hold in the nursery trade. Perhaps their biggest turtle was the ascendancy of the hybrid tea of floribunda roses, which, though beautiful, are prone to disease, often rather awkward as shrubs, and of course, in need of elaborate protection in most Canadian winter conditions. Tragically, many roses that were developed to survive such fear conditions were allowed to fall into oblivion or nearly so. It is only lately that a renewed interest in such roses has resulted in their rediscovery and a reassessment of their value. He goes on to say the following. This is a partial list of hardy heritage roses, most developed in Canada that we have tested in our zone fort site in Cornhill, New Brunswick. Hardiness is a given, although many could be valuable as breeding parents. Parents, sorry. What primarily interests us here is their landscape potential. And there you have it. Roses for the landscape, roses for the garden, roses that will actually grow in our gardens and in our landscape. We also have articles from David Slezak, and he, I met David years ago at one of the lily conventions, and he was hybridizing roses then, and he has finally come up with one of them. So there are a lot of articles about roses in the book. I, I read the book several times, with both this copying editor, just looking at the books and reviewing them, and as a book itself. I can't say enough about it. Anyway, that's it for me. Thank you so much, Sandy. I'll now invite our other panelists to join us live and we'll open the floor to questions from you all. Uh, so please do feel free to write your questions just in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then one of our fine panelists will attempt to answer them. Again, as we mentioned earlier, there's an incredible brain trust here when it comes to flowers and other blooming items here on the prairies. So uh, if there is somebody who has potentially more expertise than somebody here, we will offer the option for you to answer the question. Uh, if you do feel comfortable and don't mind appearing on camera or audibly, feel free to just raise your hand and then we'll bring you into the conversation. But I'm gonna start things off with a question that we've received from uh, Diane. And she mentioned, uh, Lime Ricky, will it bloom July through September? So Lime Ricky would be an example of the hydrangeas that we talked about earlier. It is a cultivar of hydrangea arborescence. And it is then one of those plants that have those never ending indestructible flowers. So blooms are initiated in July and they will literally persist for the rest of summer. So yes, they will persist till early October in our climate here, um, new flowers being generated at the same time. So yeah, it's one of those candidates. Wonderful. Diane was also wondering, what was the name of the Weigala again? Was it white snow? April snow, April, April snow. snow. Yeah. So Shannon asks, Sandy, if you could pick two or three very favorite hardy roses, what would they be? Oh, uh, Sandy, you're just- There I am. There you are. Sorry. Lambert Kloss is one of the Explorer roses and it's really, really probably one of my favorites. Um, Linda also has it in her garden. It starts blooming in the spring and it doesn't stop blooming until, I don't know, October. That's my favorite. Fantastic. Thank you, Sandy. So uh, Monique was wondering, I have struggled with shade in my yard. 
Is there a hydrangea which is shade tolerant and zone three hardy? Yeah, so the answer to that is the arborescence group in particular will tolerate partial shade. And usually what we mean by, you know, partial shade, partial sun, kind of th three hours of direct sunlight per day, um, it performs very well under those conditions. In fact, where it grows naturally, it is in the understory of forests. So paniculata, it likes its light a little more. Um, we would consider it trending towards full sun. But uh, all hydrangeas don't mind a bit of shade. There's no question about that. So here's an organizational question for Nikki, who is wondering what happens to the proceeds uh, from the sales of the Prairie Garden books? I, I could try answering that. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can, Linda. Yeah. Um, yes, we are a nonprofit, and uh, therefore we are not out for profit. We, are, we wish to cover our expenses and to maintain a reasonable reserve in the bank in case something happens. So uh, our prices have always reflected that we are not trying to make rich persons out of ourselves. We are, we are volunteers, nonprofit volunteers. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh -huh. uh, Donna Gold was wondering, what would you suggest for shady flowering shrubs under tall cedars? They would receive morning sun until around 10.30 uh, to 11 a.m. So some of the plants that we talked about uh, this evening um, are shade tolerant. Um, one of the things we see with flowering shrubs is typically if we take them out of the sun, flowering and fruiting tend to be reduced. And so not all plants are comfortable with a shady environment, but there are a few exceptions. Uh, cranberries, we mentioned uh, high bush cranberry, and there are some small starch statured cultivars now on that species that would be very comfortable under some cedar plants as she had suggested. Um, going back to our hydrangeas, again, the arborescence group, large leaves, you know, they, they're very happy in a, in a partially shaded environment like that. And after that, I mean, some of the other flowering shrubs that we consider in shady environments, dogwoods tend to do fairly well. The viburnum group as a whole tends to do very, very well. So yeah, there are, there are some fits. Uh, Diane has returned with another question. She was wondering if lime ricky grows on old wood or if it should be cut back. So all of the hydrangeas that we talked about tonight, they bloom on one year wood. They bloom on current season growth. And what that means is you can be quite aggressive with the pruning strategy with hydrangeas. I'll tell you what I do in my yard. And that is I leave them intact through the winter, but first thing in the spring before really a whole lot of activation happens. So we're talking early April, mid April, depending on the year, I would go out and I would cut those plants back. Um, arborescence almost right to the ground, paniculata maybe leaving uh, six inches. So it's a major cutback, you know, and if you've got a 10 year old paniculata, you're taking off probably 75% of its canopy, but they respond very well to that pruning. They generate new growth and there will be flowers on that new growth. Thank you so much. Uh, Richard was wondering if hydrangeas should be pruned. Yeah, and that kind of builds on that. And, and I'm wondering if, if, if Colleen Zachariah, she has tremendous experience with hydrangeas. If she wants to join in here, I'd be appreciative of that. But I would say our experience has been all hydrangeas benefit from renewal pruning, uh, annual pruning that would basically remove old growth, dried up flower heads, and give them an opportunity to surge again in the spring. Um, if you read um, uh, Colleen Zacharias's contribution to the book, you'll find uh, pruning instructions there. Fantastic. Thank you, Linda. So Shannon Coughlin writes to say, Philip, my favorite lilac is Madame Jolie double white. Smells like heaven on earth. Do you know a comparable colored lilac? So whites are not in high, as high demand, I don't think, as they used to be. Um, Certainly, you know, if you go way back, we had uh, Madame Lemoyne. Um, most of the lilacs today are coming out in shades of pink and blue. Um, 
reds, pinky reds, but yeah, I can't think of a lot of newer white ones. There was a photograph that we had in the presentation um, of a Preston lilac that has some pink coloration. Uh, but the name is slipping my mind right now. So if someone wants to join in, uh, feel free there. The other French lilac that you could argue has white blooms tinged with pink is Beauty of Moscow. And many people consider it one of the best. I think she was asking about lilacs that are not white, that are still fragrant. And oh, I, I can refer sorry. her to Jane Cahill's wonderful article in our book. I think um, my friend Jane Cahill only buys lilacs that smell wonderful. So all of the ones that are in that, that are featured in that article, I have actually smelled them myself, and they are heavenly. Um, if you if you wait for a moment, I can I can look up all the names. Or Jane, if you want to check in uh, via the chat, you're more than welcome to do so. Do you want to move on to the next? Certainly. Uh, so while we're waiting, Kim was wondering if there are any blooming shrubs that deer are not too fond of. Well, where we live, uh, south side of Portage, we have 17 acres and we have deer wandering through our yard all year long. And they do have certain plants that they really enjoy. Uh, something like cedar, eastern white cedar would be one of their favorites. Um, we found them even chewing on uh, Medora juniper last year, which we always thought was fairly resistant to deer feeding. But to answer the question, um, hydrangeas would be a good example of a plant that is deer resistant. Um, Potentilla was another plant we talked about today that would be deer resistant. We've had good success in our yard with a number of the viburnums where we haven't seen any deer predation on them. And hey, if you want to throw in a sense of humor here, how about barberry? Because no animal will get too close to that one. Thanks so much. This is a question for you, Sandy. Uh, so this is from Nikki. Uh, Nikki was wondering, Sandy, do you have any advice for those red rose weevils that have decimated her rose buds? Uh, she was also wondering if the book speaks to pests as well. Oh, and Sandy, you'll just have to unmute so we can hear you. Here I go. For starters, I just wanted to say, I prepared a slideshow and forgot to turn it on. I'm an idiot. But Repeat the question for me, please, John. I'm sorry. I can't Not a problem you. at all. I'll just quickly pull it up. Uh, Nikki was wondering if you had any advice for those red rose weevils that have decimated her rosebuds, or if the book speaks to pests as well. Red rose beetle. I don't know of a red rose beetle. Is red anybody... rose weevil. I'm sorry? The red rose weevil. The weevil. I have never had a weevil in my garden. I'm really sorry to say. No, actually, I'm not sorry to say. Um, it's, it's not a bad idea. Roses are kind of funny. To use um, even soapy water, if you don't want to use a pesticide, that usually gets rid of most of the critters. Fantastic. So one more question for you, Sandy. This is from an anonymous attendee who was wondering if you have any suggestions on native roses that produced hips for birds. Probably one of the best roses for hips is a horrible rose called Alika. It's a Russian rose. It suckers like crazy, but it has absolutely fabulous hips. I think Rosa Moisei also has hips, but most of the other ones, no, they don't really have too many. Um, Rosa Glauca, uh, possibly. Thank you. It used to be Rose and Rupert for Elias, sorry. Well, I mean, you could also plant the, the prairie rose, the, any of the roses that are native to our region, and you could obtain them from a place like Prairie Regionals or Prairie, prairie Flora, one of the native plant uh, suppliers. Okay. We know the pollinators like them. So I have a quick uh, follow-up comment from Diane and then a question from Michelle. Uh, Diane just wanted to comment, uh, Linda, wow, a dollar for a very early edition of the Prairie Garden, what a year that was. If you think about the price of the books today, it's a great buy. And she wanted to uh, thank you for keeping the prices just so affordable. Uh, 
And then Michelle uh, said, thanks for the nod to plants that support pollinators and more. Uh, she's very interested in the trials uh, Jeffries is running, confirming survival in local conditions, and small lilacs for smaller yards in green spaces. Uh, do you assess support of pollinators in your trials? So thanks for that question. You know, I have to be honest and, and say that up until recently, I never thought too much about the linkage between sterile blooms and native bee populations. And so for the first time this summer, I went out there and I, we have in the trial, we probably have close to, I'm going to say 35 different hydrangea cultivars. And out of that 35, there would likely be five that would have fertile flowers to an extent that they are actually um, supporting uh, native insect populations. And it's striking to walk those rows and you'll go past one cultivar in full bloom, you won't see a single insect on it. You'll come to the next one that has fertile florets and it's just alive and buzzing. And so that was really interesting to note. And I guess since I observed that, I've been kind of sounding the message out because I think it's important, not that we can't grow hydrangeas with sterile panicles, but just to recognize that there are some choices out there and to encourage uh, integrating some of these pollen producing cultivars into our landscapes. Wonderful, thank you. So we have three more questions in the Q&A, which we'll go through very quickly before we wind things down this evening. Thank you all so very much for your questions. Uh, Terry and Carol Galloway were wondering, how do you encourage wisteria to bloom in Manitoba? Interesting, Terry taught me uh, intro entomology. That's gotta be back in about 94. And uh, always enjoyed his passion for, for bugs. Wisteria is a fascinating plant. It's one of those plants we just wish was a little tougher. It, it's really a zone four species. We have a single cultivar that we've been trying to promote here in zone three. It's called Blue Moon Wisteria. I have a neighbor uh, just about a half kilometer away. I was in his yard a week ago and he has wisteria growing on trellises. These are wooden trellises. They would be about two meters in height. They would be um, trying again to create a microclimate where there's good heat uh, accumulation in the summer and somewhat of winter protection. So these are south facing trellises. I would encourage you to consider something like that. It is a vine, so get it up and try to find a microclimate where you've got heat accumulation in your yard. Thank you kindly. So another anonymous attendee have planted little lime hydrangeas in 2018 and so far has had no flowers, just green foliage. They were wondering why that is. Mm -hmm. Well, again, others are welcome to chime in here on this one. My experience with little lime, we do have it in the trial here that we talked about tonight. I have not been impressed with it. And what we have found, and, and I don't wanna say this is a universal statement, but a lot of these dwarf hydrangeas, which have been promoted as such, you know, tiny plants, they don't have enough vigor and strength to perform as they should in our landscape. Um, little lime, again, I, I could put pictures up on screen here now with it in full bloom, so I can tell you it does flower, but it lacks that vigor and that drive that you'd find in some of the medium to tall statured cultivars. I expect what you're seeing there, it could be a bit of a latency effect as that plant is just trying to establish itself and strengthen itself. Uh, flowering is a tremendously intensive process. It takes a lot of energy out of plants. And so when we see them hesitating to do that, we often wonder, well, are they a bit stressed? Are they just kind of establishing themselves? So give it another chance, give it another year. So just to close down the evening, we have one more question. Uh, and thank you all very much for your questions. There are a few we won't be able to get to, I'm afraid, simply uh, for, by virtue of time. But as you all know, the Prairie Garden is an incredible resource for questions like that. And who knows, you might even find some of them answered in the book itself. So Trish Rothsthorn was wondering, or says, I have scarlet trumpet honeysuckles against a white chain link fence spaced six feet apart. Is there a recommendation of another shrub that I could plant in between those? Uh, 
the fence is approximately 30 feet in length. Yeah, so lots of candidates for an environment like that. I would think your biggest considerations, you wouldn't want uh, suckering, anything that suckers that would possibly, you know, creep into your beautiful scarlet trumpet honeysuckles there. But there would be a list of dozens of cultivars that would fit in that space. Just to mention a few that we talked about tonight, uh, some of the exciting ones that are, are coming out that we're very interested in. Uh, the pearl bush would be an example of a plant that would fit in a space like that. Um, any of the medium statured hydrangeas would be very successful in a place like that. Um, if you're trying to hi hide that six foot fence, you know, I would say you're looking for a small to medium shrub. And you mentioned the honeysuckles, they flower all summer, June to September. So perhaps you want a shrub that will do the same. And again, we've talked about some of those here tonight. So um, there is a question as well about the slides. And I guess maybe when, as we wrap up here, John, I just say like, is there a way for me to um, post this presentation on McNally's site where it could be downloaded or what would be the best way to deliver? Cause I'm happy to share those photos. Oh, certainly. Well, perhaps uh, I'm afraid we don't have a way to post it on our website itself. Uh, but if anybody out there would like to get in touch uh, with us to request uh, copies of the slides, you can either email me or you can email the Prairie Garden directly too. And one of us will be sure to uh, pass that information along. I'm afraid we don't have a central download place ourselves on our website. There will be a YouTube video, correct? Uh, yes, indeed. So there will also be the option of re-watching the uh, presentations on YouTube. This video is streaming to YouTube currently and will remain up there. So you can revisit it, slow it down, take notes, or do whatever you'd like with the video. Thanks. So we've come to the close of our event. Uh, I was wondering, if, would anybody, any of our panelists like to offer any final words at all? Well, just a shout out to you, John, for being a wonderful host tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. No, and thank you all. It's been a real pleasure, as always, working with the Prairie Garden. Uh, typically, the launches always fell on Sundays, which was my day off. So it's delightful to be here with you all, even virtually, to celebrate the launch of the 2021 Prairie Garden. So in closing, I'd just like to mention uh, here at McNally Robinson, we have many copies of the Prairie Garden. So feel free to get in touch if you'd like to order any from us. Although we are sadly close to the public, we are offering contactless curbside pickup and we also offer delivery and carrier service within Winnipeg too. So just give us a call, send us an email or get in touch online and we'll be sure to get a copy of this incredibly useful book in your hands. But I'd like to, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Quite a few copies that have been signed by the guest editor, right? Absolutely. Right over the flower, you can see that uh, guest editor Philip Rowland has signed many copies here in the store. So just specify that you'd like a signed copy when you talk to us and we'll be sure that that's the one that gets to you. Thank you. I'd like to close by thanking uh, Philip Rowland, Sandy Venton, and of course, uh, Linda Dietrich for uh, helping to organize this event and being so wonderful to work with. And thank you all out there, either on Zoom or on YouTube now or in the future for your attendance, your incredibly thoughtful questions and your warm comments within the chat. I'm going to copy the chat as soon as we're finished and send it to the participants so they can see all your wonderful words. But until then, please, all of you, Stay safe, stay healthy, and thank you all once again. It's been a pleasure spending the evening with you. And same here. Bye. Good night, everybody. <laughs>